For the first 22 years of the faith, Islam was Islam. There was no division amongst any of the believers, be it in their interpretations or in their application. There was only the Word of God as the sole source for Islamic law, a Qur'an that was unquestioned. This phase of Islam also had the Prophet Muhammad's presence in person, there to guide with his interpretations, clarifications, and actions. Believers had the real-time example of the Prophet and his traditions to follow, and that they did, all of them, without exception. Upon the Prophet's passing in 632 current era, things changed. It wasn't the question of the faith and its system that challenged the Muslims in that moment. It was the element of his succession that introduced the earliest element of division. This event in Islamic history wouldn't be the sole situation concerning how succession would play a critical role in further separating the Muslim nation from within, and would remain a major cause for subsequent divergences within Islam over the next millennium. Two additional elements would also play an important role in the eventual split of Islam into further subgroups, and they are, first, the relevance or not of the Sunnah, the Prophet's deeds, guidance, and traditions, as documented in the various hadiths, and its importance as a vital element of the faith's practice. And second, were the various schools that concluded their own ijma, meaning consensus concerning the interpretations and jurisprudence of the Qur'an, that would typically result in a version of Islamic law. One intriguing hadith, a saying by the Prophet, that will set us off perfectly on our journey into the various sects, denominations, schools, traditions, and creeds of Islam, was how he foretold of the many divisions that will characterize Islam in its upcoming future much in the same way that Judaism and Christianity experienced with their respective eventual branching out. The Jews split into 71 sects. The Christians split into 72 sects. And my nation will split into 73 sects. As much as this video follows an iceberg video concept from a content perspective, I don't think the analogy really works in this case. I'd like to introduce an alternative to how we attempt to reveal the various layers of the divisions and subdivisions within Islam. I believe a tree is much more applicable. Its complexity and totality is revealed to us from the very beginning. But what is difficult to decipher is just how many branches and sub-branches exist. Where and when do they start and end? Are they alive, or has that specific branch, small or large, ceased to exist? And the way I want to go about breaking it down is not about which sect was first and which came last, not about the one characterized by the largest or smallest following, and definitely not approaching it from a position of which sect or division is right or wrong. This is about revealing the extent of the branching out that the Prophet himself envisioned and the causes for such divisions, with a hinting at their unique beliefs or doctrines. Our journey will commence with the most simplistic version of Islam, and as I said previously, one that starts with the most vital source of guidance for the faith, and that's the holy book, the Qur'an. Qur'aniyun, or Qur'anism, is founded on the belief that the Qur'an is the only source for religious law and guidance. With such a belief, Qur'anism omitted the Sunnah and its substantial Hadith system. The Qur'an and Qur'anist opinion could be clearly interpreted either through direct exegesis or through a method called interpreting the Qur'an with the Qur'an, that is, the interpretation of unclear words, expressions, or contexts using other parts of the Qur'an that were substantially clearer. Since Qur'anists claimed to have an early presence in Islam, they were the first to voice and believe that the hadiths on which the Sunnah was based were inaccurate and flawed due to the tardiness of their reflections, recordings, and clarifications of the words and actions of the Prophet. Hadiths were only collected, recorded, and attributed through a chain of narrators to the Prophet almost two centuries after his death. Qur'anists, though, would heavily rely on the Rai, meaning personal reasoning and human intellect, to complement the directives and wisdoms of the Holy Book, to fulfill the various undefined gaps within the Qur'an's revelations on Islamic practice, laws, and behavior. Qur'anism would see a revival during the Islamic modernist movement of the late 19th century that would attempt a major return to a more fundamental version of Islam. For Shia Islam, a key moment took place at Ghadir Khum, a valley between Mecca and Medina in 632 current era. 
months before his death, when the Prophet stood at a sermon and proclaimed that upon his passing, he would leave his nation with two treasures that would lead them without error, the Book of God, the Quran, and his progeny, the Ahl al-Bayt. Upon the Prophet's death, the first caliph chosen by the Sahaba, the Prophet's companions, would be Abu Bakr as-Siddiq, one of the earliest converts but with no blood relation, thereby denying Ali ibn Abi Talib, the Prophet's cousin and son-in-law, whom a major contingent of early Muslims expected would lead the nation. This crisis of succession would see the first true split in Islam and would be followed by subsequent events over the next 50 years, such as the slaying of Hussein bin Ali, the Prophet's grandson in 680, that would lead to and define the largest schism in the faith due to the disregard for the Prophet's family in terms of religiously leading the nation. Shia Islam would go on to separate not only in terms of succession loyalty, but also in terms of their religious divine leadership, as well as develop slightly varied practices of prayers, fasting, and other beliefs. Sunni Islam constitutes the largest sect in Islam, numbering over 80% of all Muslims. Sunni Islam derives its name from the fundamental belief that the Sunan, plural of Sunnah, being the traditions of the Prophet as well as the various hadiths that record such guidance, are an intrinsic part of the revelations of the faith, and a major component to comprehensively understanding Islam. The Sunnah expands in areas where the Qur'an was general or open for interpretation. The Sunnah became a form of social reform that addressed religious practices and structured the behavior of Muslims on a wide spectrum of day-to-day -day life. Sunni Islam, as a fully structured belief system, was absent from the early days of the faith, and only started achieving its development almost two full centuries after the death of the Prophet. The Caliphs recognized that the faith was characterized by major variations in the interpretation of the Qur'an, and struggled with loose personal rai interpretations that attempted to address the gaps in Islamic practice. The Sunnah, a rich source of knowledge and wisdom, was unpreserved and remained intact solely as an oral tradition. And hence came a major effort in Islam in gathering and documenting these hadiths and attributing them back to the Prophet through a direct line of narrators and subsequently, these new prophetic accounts, the Sunnah, became an integral part of the Sunni Muslim faith. During the first fitna, the first internal Islamic war between the fourth caliph, Ali ibn Abi Talib, and the rebellious group led by Muawiyah, the governor of Syria, and his allies, the powerful Bani Kalb tribe, a stalemate at the Battle of Sifin resulted in a call for arbitration to settle the conflict between the two parties that the Caliph Ali would eventually accept. Such a decision enraged a large group, a group previously loyal to the Caliph Ali, who would declare both Muawiyah and Ali and their followers as infidels, and hence were given the name Al Khawarij, meaning those who had left or strayed. Their belief was based on the premise of an anti nepotism movement that seems to have festered during the early Umayyad dominance of the Caliphate, and that any devout and decent Muslim qualified for the role of a Caliph. Kharjits also held the entire Muslim nation responsible for the ethics and morality of their leadership. Should any Caliph stray from the righteous path, then it was the duty of all Muslims to rebel and depose such immoral leadership. Mu'tazilism was one of the first branches in Islam that came about during the first fitna in 656. The Mu'tazilites were a group who took a neutral position in the conflict between the Caliph Ali and his opponents. The name Mu'tazil means to withdraw, to retire, and the school of theology slowly retired in its own version of speculative theology and jurisprudence. Such a school developed in the 10th century to reflect a major rationalism that was influenced heavily by the Greek philosophies of antiquity. This rationalism termed the Mu'tazilites as the Ahl al-Kalam, the people of speculation, and their philosophy that would be based on three dogmatic principles, the oneness and justice of God, the human freedom of action and will, and last and most contentious, the assertion that the Qur'an was not eternal and was hence created, and as God had no separate parts, the Qur'an then could not be considered a part of God, or the Word of God. This last point would label the Mu'tazilites as heretics and excommunicated from Islam up until the branch's re-emergence during the mid to late 19th century with the arrival of Islamic modernism. Al-Athariyya or Atharism 
was one of the early schools of Islamic theology in the late 8th century. Atharists followed a strict doctrine in adherence to the Quran and Sunnah, influenced by the traditionalist companion of the Prophet, Zubayr ibn al-Awwam. Its main pushback was concerning the increasingly rationalist version of Islam, and its response was to return to a more disciplined textualism in interpreting the Quran and the Hadiths. The scholarly circles who established the movement were called the Ahl al-Hadith, the people of the prophetic discourses. The name Athar is derived from the Arabic word for historic ruins or traditions, and is symbolic of the movement's return to the origins of Islam and its reliance on the Quran and the actions and guidance of the Prophet. Rationalism in all its shapes and forms, even if verifying the truth, would be totally forbidden. In Kufa, Iraq, the capital of the Islamic world at the time, the Sunni Imam Abu Hanifa would establish the Hanafi school of thought, a school structuring the laws and practices of the Islamic faith. Iraq being a considerable distance away from the epicenter of the faith, Mecca and Medina, there was a considerable level of concern with the application of too much weight towards the hadiths orally recorded during that era. Abu Hanifa and his colleagues also didn't have much, if any, interactions with the Sahaba, the Prophet's companions, who could provide direct and more accurate accounts in relaying the Prophet's actions, reactions, or guidance. Consequently, Hanafis were very cautious and strict in their acceptance of hadiths, and only if validity was confirmed beyond a reason of doubt would they integrate such hadiths into their jurisprudence. So for the Hanafis, the Quran remained their main source for the establishment of Islamic law and exegesis, and was accompanied with a flexible, independent, and rational approach in interpreting the various details of how to practice the Muslim faith. Just over a century beyond the passing of the Prophet, the people of Medina and Mecca were applying the practices and traditions virtually learned directly from the Prophet's lifetime. It was in this era that the Imam of Medina, Malik ibn Anas, who was a renowned jurist, scholar, and theologian, established the second Sunni school of Islamic jurisprudence, the Maliki school. Malik recognized that even though the practices of the faith had only been a generation or two away from the lifetime of the Prophet, it was necessary to establish an official and structured school that surveyed all the existing laws, justices, rituals, and practices of the religion as per the local believers, as well as introduce all the wisdoms of highly learned theological minds of the time and place. His aim was to establish a smooth path for all Muslims, to practice their faith without confusion or contention by creating a standard that was settled through consensus of scholars, while applying all complementary rulings within the Sunnah, for even the most minute or elementary of questions. The Al-Shafi'i school came into being immediately after the Maliki school. Indeed, the teacher of Imam Al-Shafi'i, the founder of the school, was none other than Malik ibn Anas, the eponym of the Maliki school. The Shafi'i would pursue many of the principles of the Maliki school, except for two significant elements. The first was that for the Shafi'is, the hadiths were not only complementary for the interpretations of the Qur'an, but the hadiths and the sunnah were upgraded onto equal footing with the Qur'an, and that the holy book could only be interpreted using the hadiths and explained in light of such traditions. The second element that set the Sunni as Shafi'i school apart from preceding Muslim schools of law was the structure that was inherent in its jurisprudence. The Shafi'i would introduce a framework that included a hierarchical system of importance of various sources that would become the primary and guiding science of fiqh, Islamic jurisprudence, for centuries to come. The Hanbali school, or Hanbalism, is the last of the four major schools of jurisprudence in terms of its appearance in Islamic history. Ahmad ibn Hanbal was a disciple of his predecessor, Imam al-Shafi'i, yet he took it upon himself to dive deeper into the field of prophetic tradition, jurisprudence, and the defense of orthodoxy in Sunni Islam. The Hanbali's most important contribution was the bolstering of the Qur'an as the uncreated word of God, and that the Qur'an was above human comprehension, and that only Muslim scholars had the ability, awareness, and experience to properly interpret Holy Scripture. And in complement, the demands imposed by the Hanbali school in terms of juris training and experience, and in order for them to generate reasonings or rulings of Islamic law, were very strict and of the highest standards. A complete mastery of the Hadith catalogue was necessary. Yet even with these strict demands, Hanbalism 
reflected an acceptance of the juridical differences with the other preceding Islamic schools, a point of view that was totally unique to its method. At the siege of Mecca in 683, and during the second Muslim civil war, the second fitna, was when Ibadism emerged as a distinct sect of Islam. Ibadism is named after Abdullah ibn Ibad, who was originally part of the Khawarij sect that rebelled against Ali ibn Abi Talib after the Battle of Sifin. Ibad and his followers split further from the Kharjits due to the extremist nature and actions of the latter. Ibad was a moderate, who would return to his home city in Iraq with the remaining Basran Kharjits. There, they were persecuted for their support of the uprising against the Umayyads, but were set free and left Iraq for Yemen and Oman never to return. One main difference for the Ibadis came with the idea of succession and leadership. The Ibadi Orthodox Laden doctrine didn't put so much value in the Imam's genealogy or even a need for them to rule the entire Muslim nation. On the contrary, they were convinced that an Imam for each community was a viable ruling structure. Ibadi doctrine also promoted that knowledge of God was innate through reason and not by learning. Ibadis also expanded on the idea that when a Quranic verse contradicted human reason, it had to then be interpreted metaphorically. In 740, Zayd ibn Ali led a renewed revolt against the Umayyad Caliph, Hisham ibn Abd al-Malik. Zayd, as the great-grandson of Ali ibn Abi Talib, still believed he had a just claim to the Islamic Caliphate and was further supported by prominent Sunni jurists. Yet, desertion by his allies would come to characterize his uprising and Zayd would fall in battle against the Umayyads. Zaydiya or Zaydism would be born and became one of the main branches of Shia Islam, but would maintain a relative proximity to the Sunni sect of Islam. Zaydism would follow the Hanbali school in many of its rulings, yet its main case for division from Sunni Islam was more or less the method of succession after the passing of the Prophet. Zaydism believed that Zayd ibn Ali is the rightful successor to the Imamate due to his rebellion, and also believed that the Imam receives religious knowledge and wisdom, and therefore leadership gains stature through learning rather than through divine designation. Thus jurisprudence through ijtihad, reasoning, qiyas, and analogy as tools for interpretation were prioritized over obedience and mysticism. The Ja'fari Shia school of jurisprudence is named after Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq. In the mid-8th century, the Ja'fari school would go on to elaborate and formalize the doctrine pertaining to the Shia imamate. A belief and a concept called Nas was introduced, that only a person appointed by God and by the Prophet, and then by each preceding imam by explicit designation, could lead the Muslim community. All imams had to be descendants of the Prophet from his daughter Fatma and her husband, Ali ibn Abi Talib. One major detail that would separate the Ja'fari doctrine from all preceding schools of jurisprudence was the separation of the caliphate from the imamate. The governance of the people was different than the rule of the faith. Another significant concept that the Ja'fari school introduced into Islam was isma, a concept of incorruptible innocence of the imamate, as well as their moral infallibility and immunity from sin. Ismailism is one of the several branches that emerged from the Ja'fari sect of Shia Islam. Again, this break was due to the succession of the Imamate. Upon the death of Ja'far al-Sadiq in 765, there was a confusion as to who would take leadership of the Imamate from amongst his sons. Ismail had been granted the distinction of Imam by his father's divine decree. The same claim by another younger brother, Musa al-Kadhim, also stated that al-Sadiq had revoked the original decree naming Ismail as his successor and that Musa was the next Imam. Ismail, by then, had been absent from the political scene for many years, but was believed to not only be alive and the seventh Imam of Islam, but would remain alive up until his reappearance as the Al-Mahdi. Beyond the succession of Islam and the Imamate, the branch is one of the most rigorous and strict monotheistic versions of Islam and follows a major influence of the philosophical school of Neoplatonism in its understandings of God and the oneness of God. A major difference in Ismailism than any other Muslim faith is their disbelief in the status of Muhammad as the seal of the prophets. 
Sufism introduced a structured mysticism into Islam that might have been experimented with in the faith since its early days. And during the seeming worldliness and materialism of the Umayyad Caliphate in the 7th century, Sufism's rise came under the guidance of the ascetic preacher and theologian Hassan al-Basri, who wanted to protect the purity of the faith by distancing away from the political and economic domains. Sufi comes from the word tasawwuf, meaning the wearer of wool, suggesting a move away from the comforts and distractions of the material world. Thus, the Sufis brought into Islam the formal concept of asceticism and developed the idea of the internalization of faith. Sufism believed that only through the strict emulation of the way of the Prophet would a connection with the Divine be realized. Sufism, as with other branches of Islam, also believed that a divinely ordained leader, a wali, meaning saint, can lead them, and such a leadership will only apply if a succession chain of teachers linking the wali back to the Prophet was confirmed. Sufism was originally mainly considered as a Sunni branch, but some of its subsequent divisions did cross the line over into Shia doctrine. Abul Mansur al maturidi was an Uzbek Sunni Muslim scholar who followed the practices of the Hanafi school of jurisprudence. In the early 10th century, al maturidi would introduce reforms that allowed for more theological inquiry, leading to the establishment of the Maturidi school of theology. This orthodox Sunni creed repositioned rationality at the forefront for the interpretation of the Holy Scripture. In parallel to this prioritization of rationality was the reliance on allegorical interpretation of expressions within the Qur'an. Al-Maturidi further clarified aspects of faith that no action nor practice could increase faith. Faith, he said, cannot decrease or increase in substance, but that piety may increase through renewal and repetition. The Zahiri school is at times considered the fifth school of Sunni jurisprudence. Following in the teachings of Dawood al Zahiri, a scholar, jurist, and theologian during the Golden Age of Islam, Zahirism strictly adhered to extreme literalism and the objective or exposed meanings of expressions in the Quran. Analogical deductions or societal customs were totally forbidden. All forms of speculation that were in existence by the 9th century were abandoned by al Zahiri and his followers. The school would exist independently across the Middle East and Muslim Andalusia up until five centuries later when it would go on to re-merge with the Hanbali school. Twelver Shi'ism, a follower of all the practices of Ja'fari jurisprudence, is the largest Shia branch that believes in the succession of 12 divinely ordained Imams who followed after the Prophet Muhammad. These exemplary humans ruled over Islam at its birth through Ali ibn Abi Talib, all the way till Hujjat Allah ibn al Hasan, the final and current Imam, who is the prophesied Mahdi. The Twelvers followed the succession of the Imam Musa ibn Ja'far, that saw the split away from those of the Ismaili order in the latter 8th century. As per Twelver doctrine, these Imams would not only rule with justice over the Muslim community, but would interpret the Sharia, God's divine law, as well as define the esoteric meanings of the Quran. Nizari Ismailism is the second largest branch of Shia Islam, and as per their name, would follow in the path of Ismailism. During the reign of the Fatimid Caliphate, Imam al-Mustansir Billah had appointed his son Nizar as his rightful heir. Upon al-Mustansir's death, his most powerful vizier, al-Afdal, claimed that the dying Caliph had made a deathbed decree changing the appointment to his much younger son, al-Mustasim. This coup would lead to a bitter feud, an ultimate breakaway sect in the name of the forsaken son, Nizar. The Nizaris would be headed by their religious leader, Hassan al-Sabah, that continued on the Ismaili tradition, but with the main point of difference being the succession of the Imamate. Only those of the bloodline of Nizar ibn al-Mustansir would go on to become the Imams of their order. With the establishment of Nizari Ismailism came the further re-specification of Ismailism as Musta'li Ismailism. The Musta'lis carry on the banner of Ismailism as it was legitimized by the succession of his Musta'li as the next rightful Caliph, an Imam after the passing of his father, al muntasar Billah. No further changes in Ismaili doctrine would ensue. Halawism was established in the 9th century by Ibn Nusayr, a disciple of the 10th 12er Imam Ali al-Hadi and the 11th 12er Imam 
Hassan al-Askari. It meant that deviation from Twelver doctrine came with the belief that Ali ibn Abi Talib, the first Imam, was the physical manifestation of God. The Alawis also accepted that the religion was totally separate and distinct from Shi'ism and incorporated a doctrine of the trinity of three aspects of the one God. The ma'na, suggesting meaning, the ism, meaning the name, and the bab, indicating the door. These aspects have been reiterated over time to eventually result in the trinity of Ali, Muhammad, and Salman al-Farisi, the latter being one of the companions of the Prophet. Alevism, in reference to Ali ibn Abi Talib, is a branch of Islam that incorporates many traditions from the Twelver Shia doctrine while adding some elements of Turkish shamanism. This division follows the teachings of Hajj Bektash Veli, who is a mystical Islamic teacher. Alevism follows a loosely structured interpretation of Islam that was equally representative of an identity and a culture. Sufism and its inner spiritual search for meaning also played an important role in Alevi doctrine, and further expressed by their belief that Muhammad and Ali became so close to God that they achieved ittihad, meaning a mystical union. More orthodox elements of fundamental Islam go missing though from Alevism, such as the lack of an ablution process, the physical cleansing prior to prayer, and the fasting of the holy month of Ramadan. Qaramishans came into existence in the latter parts of the 9th century, a militant Seveneur Ismaili Shia order that mixed the beliefs of many other branches into a religious, utopian socialist system. One of the main reasons for their separation from the Ismaili branch was the rejection of the Fatimid Caliph Ubaidullah's ascension to the Imamate. They also refused the fifth pillar of Islam, the Hajj pilgrimage, considering it a superstition. And such a rejection led to an all-out attack on Mecca in the mid-10th century, when they murdered many pilgrims, ransacked the Kaaba, and held the Black Stone for ransom. Don't forget to join the Chronicles by subscribing to the channel. And like it if you do actually like it. And by clicking the notification button, you'll be up to date on all new releases. Wahhabism is a reformist Sunni movement that came about in the late 18th century through the teachings of the Muslim scholar Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab. The movement followed the Hanbali school, but took on an extremely orthodox stance against the practice of the faith that had developed in Islam over the many centuries that included many innovations and rituals. The Wahhabis looked back towards the purity of the first three generations of Muslims, the Salaf, who were the companions of the Prophet, and those that followed them. With these reforms, Salafism targeted the removal of the various corruption that Islam had assimilated, especially during the Ottoman Caliphate period. Diobandi Sunnism was established in British-occupied India in the mid-19th century. It is one of the first Islamic branches to respond with an Islamic doctrine addressing dangers of colonialist assimilation. At the time, the British had enacted extreme methods of cultural and religious domination in India. As a response, the already highly scholastic Diobandi movement, known for its piety and Hanafi school adherence, shifted its approach to resist the British through military means. Two main doctrinal features of the Diobandi movement was its strong rejection of innovations in religious practice, called bid'ah, as well as extremely strong commitment in following the example of the Prophet as literally as possible. The Barelvi movement is a Sunni revivalist branch that is based on the Hanafi and Shafi'i schools of jurisprudence, and began in the late 19th century, and mainly in the Indian subcontinent. Barelvis also included many Sufi practices in how they venerated and were devoted to the Prophet, as more than a man, by adding further beliefs towards his special relationship and unique status with God. Unworldly features such as his divine knowledge, light, and his ability to witness the actions of people even beyond his earthly mortality, even to the extent that their belief put Muhammad's creation as preceding that of Adam and the world in general. After the fall of the Fatimid Caliphate in Egypt, the Ismailis relocated the remnant power to Yemen, and following this shift, the Tayyibi Ismaili branch was established upon the passing of the 20th Imam Al-Amr bi Ahkam Allah in the 12th century. Its creation came about with another succession disagreement between the brother of the deceased Al-Hafiz and the son of the deceased, 
the two-year-old, Abul Qasim al tayyib Upon the declaration of Al-Hafidh of himself as the rightful caliph and imam, the Yemeni Ismailis pushed back in upholding the rights of al tayyib And in that same moment, the Hafidhi Ismailis branch was created, holding firm that the rightful successor to the imamate was Al-Hafidh. Neither the Hafidhis nor the Tayyibis strayed from neither Musta'ilis nor Ismaili theological doctrines and practices. The Nukari was a movement established in the 8th century as a protest movement to the Ibadi branch in North Africa. Opposition to Ibadi systems of succession and leadership were the two causes for such dissent. Nukaris believed in the principle of the investiture of the inferior in the presence of the better, while they also took a hardline position in reducing the power of an imam and taking decisions independently and without seeking consultation of an expert and experienced counsel. Overall, the Nukari doctrine was more about decentralizing leadership while also attempting to always make room for better religious and political representation. Adabas is a sub-branch of Ibadism, founded in the Maghreb region. In the 13th century, Adabas pushed the traditional ideas of individual theological leadership further out of their religious practice and introduced a collective approach to rulings, appointments, and successions, thereby enforcing the decentralization of both political governance and religious jurisprudence. Ibn Arabi was a famous Andalusian Muslim scholar and philosopher of the 13th century, known for his title of the Sheikh al-Akbar, meaning the Grand Master. He introduced the doctrine Wihdat al-Wujud, the unity of being, into 12 Shia Muslim thought, and thus the Akbarist Sufi movement was established on his epithet. Wihdat al-Wujud is a philosophy where there is no true existence except the ultimate truth, being God. Central also to Ibn Arabi's theory and Akbar's doctrine was the concept of attainment of the perfect human, as in the Prophet and those Prophets who preceded him, and for all followers to attempt to attain such status through developed self-consciousness and self-realization. The Usulis were a major denomination within the Tolver Shia sect, relying heavily on reason for the introduction of new jurisprudence and in assessing the inclusion or exclusion of hadiths. Sully principles followed the filtration of hadiths into categories of reliability, the necessity for legal scholars to establish intellectual method of general application, from which particular rules may be deduced, and finally, in the importance of the ulama, the scholars, who had the utmost value in interpreting the Qur'an and Sunnah, and in making new rulings to respond to the new challenges confronting the faith. In the 13th century, the Sufi Bektashi order was founded in the Ottoman Empire and mainly within Anatolia. Originally, the Bektashis were one of the many Sufi orders within Sunni Islam and whose doctrines and rituals were codified by the mystic Balim Sultan. The order initiated the use of many folk paraphernalia within religious rituals and ceremonies, such as the palihenk, a large symbolic stone worn around the neck, the use of candles during rites and the introduction of rank hierarchy within the order. Bektashis, after several centuries of being within the Sunni sect of Islam, gradually shifted towards Twelver Shia doctrine. The Chisti order is a Sufi school that was established in the 10th century by Abu Ishaq al-Shami, a scholar born and bred in Damascus, Syria. Chistis are one of the oldest Sufi orders and emphasize distancing oneself from worldly power and materiality. Love, tolerance, openness, and equality were all highly valued within their religious discourse. The Chistis practiced the element of sema, meaning a listening, where devotees would lose themselves into a trance of divine presence while in appreciation of music and poetry. Jalaluddin Rumi is known to all people of modernity as the Muslim Sufi mystic and poet. The Mavlevi order, or Maulawis, was an order founded by his followers with main principles such as the knowledge of one's soul within the divine, the acceptance of all irrespective of religion and even in its absence, and the equality of man and woman, since the soul had no gender. The sectless Mevlevis would widely introduce the element of whirling into Sufi practice, a method of achieving a deep meditative state and oneness with the divine. 
Naqshbandis are a Sunni Sufi order that trace their origins to the first Rashidun Caliph, Abu Bakr as-Siddiq. The first structures to the order were put in place by Yusuf Hamadani and Abdul Khaliq Rijwani, both Sufi mystics who organized the practice and established silent dhikr, invocations, as in the act of reciting the names of Allah, prayers, and so on, solely in remembering God as a mainstay of the order. Naqshbandis would take their name from the subsequent scholar Bahauddin Naqshband Bukhari, who added many teachings to the order, such as the importance and value of time in every daily act, and informing a strong mental picture of one's heart with God at its center at all times, meaning that no heart could exist without God at its center. Qadriya is a Sufi mystic order named after Abdul Qadir Jilani, a Hanbali scholar from Jilan, Iran. The order is one of the few that adheres strictly to Sunni Islamic law. The order follows a decentralized leadership method where each center within a society can adopt its own religious interpretations and practices. Hierarchy ranking is also incorporated and the rise within these ranks is subject to dhikr, the recitations, and promotion from one level to the next necessitates the repetition of tens of thousands of chants. Asceticism is also a major practice of the faith that mandates celibacy, meditation, poverty, and mysticism for its religious leaders. When Mirza Ghulam Ahmed stated that he was divinely appointed as the promised Mahdi and Messiah in the late 19th century, the sign for the end of times was triggered, bringing about peacefully Islam's final triumph. A decade before Ahmed's death in 1899, a movement was coined in Ahmed's name and Ahmadiyya was born, reconfirming that Islam was the final way for humanity, but as a priority, it was necessary to first restore it to its true and pure form and away from its corruption over the ages. Ahmadiyya held the Quran above all else, and should any hadith contradict the word of God, no matter how credible it might be, would totally be disregarded. Ahmadiyya's ambitions were to revive the forgotten Islamic values of peace, forgiveness, and sympathy for all humankind. Dawoodi Bahras, Bahras meaning Indian Muslims, are an Ismaili denomination of Shia Islam. They generally closely follow the tenets of Orthodox Shia Islam. One belief that is unique to the Dawoodis is that there will always be an Imam, a divinely chosen leader on earth, a descendant of the Prophet and his grandson Hussein. Who will lead all humanity. And when the Imam decides to withdraw from public eye, his role will be taken over by Al Da'i Al Mutlaq, the absolute missionary, who will protect the Muslim faith till the return of the Imam. The Dawoodis split from the Tayyibi community following a Da'i succession dispute when the Dawoodis selected their namesake, Dawood ibn Qutb, as their leader. Today, the community is led by its 53rd Al Da'i Al Mutlaq. Ali Qadir Saifuddin. Sulaimani Bahras are an identical denomination as the Dawoodi Bahras and are the other half of the Tayyibi community who were party to the succession dispute. The Yemeni branch of the community selected Sulaiman ibn Hassan as their next Da'i. Since the 16th century, the Sulaimani Da'is have almost entirely come from the Makrami family of Najran, Saudi Arabia. The denomination is currently on their 26th Da'i. Ali bin Hussein al-Makrami. Salafism is a late 19th century religious movement that bases its doctrine on a return to the Salaf, the Prophet's companions, their followers, and the followers of their followers, a group of believers that practice the purest form of Islam. Beyond the Quran and Sunnah, the Salafis rely greatly on the Ijma, meaning consensus of the Salaf, and in doing so, overwrite any latter religious interpretations. The Salafis rejected all types of innovations that had come into practice by the many Sunni and Shia denominations, and in fact, even reject the main divisions themselves that had seen Islam break away into smaller and smaller groups. Sohra Wardiya is an order of mystics founded in Iraq in the 12th century. Inspired by Junaid of Baghdad in the early 10th century and founded by Abu al-Najib Sahrawardi, the order that was heavily based on sober Sufism, a method of obedience through a comprehensive awareness, had major demands on the level of dhikrs that must be performed with thousands of repetitions of the seven names of God, 
also known as the Seven Subtle Spirits, that in turn corresponded to the Seven Lights of Devotion. This order gradually shifted its base from Baghdad towards Afghanistan and then the Indian subcontinent. The Mahdawi movement was founded by Muhammad Jampuri in the late 15th century. During a pilgrimage to Mecca in 1496, and while facing the Kaaba, Jampuri claimed to be the Mahdi. Jampuri would go on to explain his dissatisfaction with the spiritual and moral degradation of Muslims and introduced the seven obligations to be strictly adhered to by his followers. Rejection of materiality, quest for divine vision, the company of honesty, migration to avoid material lust, retreat and solitude, resignation to the will of God, dhikr, and the distribution of the tith. Tijaniya is a Sufi Sunni order that was founded in the Maghrib by Ahmed at Tijani in the 18th century. The Tijaniya focused on social reform and grassroots Islamic revival, to protect the poor and to counter the dominant Muslim orders who were more interested in worldly control and domination in the North African region. Tijaniya is based on the practice of the Wird, a daily rite of passage that must be performed every morning that is both an invocation and a repetition of recitations and prayers. Muridiya is a Sufi order founded in the late 19th century in Senegal by Ahmed ibn Muhammad ibn Habibullah, a mystic and ascetic spiritual leader. The Muridiya attempted to tackle French colonialist occupation in their region not by aggressive means, but by calling for the Jihad al-Akbar, the greater struggle, to not fight with weapons, but through religious learning and the fear of God. Today, the followers of the Muridiya make up over 40% of the Senegalese population. Abu al-Hassan al-Shadli was an influential Moroccan scholar and Sufi who founded the Shadli Sufi order in the 13th century. His search for enlightenment through asceticism only brought clarity that he and his disciples had to return to the people, to assist them in applying the teachings of the faith and to transform their existence to preach that God was everywhere, in everything he had created, and only in drowning in the ocean of unity can the seeker leave behind his own existence to then be merged into the divine. The Akhbari school is a small branch of Twelver Shi'ism. The term Akhbari comes from the Arabic word for news or reports, and the split in Twelver doctrine came mainly in the form of rejecting the use of reasoning by expert jurisprudence in issuing rulings on Islamic law. Only the 14 infallibles of Twelver Islam had the authority and ability to issue legal verdicts. The Prophet, his daughter Fatma, her husband Ali, their two sons Hassan and Hussein, and the subsequent nine Imams who followed and were of Hussein's next of kin. Ishikism is a new syncretic movement involving an alternative understanding of Alevism. A main difference from Alevism is the nature of the term Alevi, in Alevism, the name represents Ali ibn Abi Talib, whereas for the Ishkis, the term suggests people of light, as derived from the Hittite language. Unlike how Alevists consider their movement, Ishikists consider Alevism and their faith fully as an esoteric group and claim that Alevism is the oldest religion in the world, since it includes all esotericism, Jewish, Christian, pagan, and Islamic esoterica. Shaykhism diverged from the Usuli and traditional Twelver Shia doctrine through its interpretation of key ideas involving the end of times and the day of resurrection. The Shaykhists' approach to such interpretation of prophecy through a strong, mystical lens when the last divine ordained leader, the Imam, who lives hidden, will reappear as the promised Mahdi. And upon his reappearance, the Imam Hussein ibn Ali shall return to conquer the world, and that Muhammad and Ali shall reappear to combat and kill Satan. Dhikrism as a name is derived by the word and act of dhikr, recitation worship. It is a Mahdist sect that believed in a persona known as Nur Pak, pure light, who walked the earth before the days of Adam and who shall return upon the end of days to restore Islam to its true form and purity. As per Dhikri Mahdi beliefs, Nur Pak has already arrived. Dhikris revere the Qur'an and hold it high above all else, while practice their prayers far differently than other more mainstream religious sects and denominations. 
Last but not least are the non-denominational Muslims. Islam started as non-denominational and in its most modern iteration, Islam returns to non-denomination. This is a 20th century classification that removes the elements of sects and without adherence to any specific doctrine. No structure exists and each follower is allowed their own interpretation of their personal faith and practice. Well, it's not actually the last, as each of the listed branches or schools recalled have further subsequent splits and iterations that might total in the tens if not hundreds of additional subdivisions in Islam. And there are others omitted that reach far outside of Islam, even though by convention have been attributed to Islam, such as the Druze faith and the Nation of Islam. From all that we have just seen and heard, the slightest of differences seem to push Muslims further away from each other. How don't the Muslim people see the bigger picture? That Muslims fundamentally believe in the same things, and much of the detail is about who ruled or was appointed many centuries ago, be it from a political, religious, or a combination of the two. Okay, it's much more than that. Interpretation, prioritization, and reasoning, the validity of hadith, all come into play and feed these growing separations. But ultimately, it indeed is a matter of perspective. If one sect believes it is above the others, as in inhabiting a larger or more perceivable part of the tree, then all the other divisions that conflict with that sect's set of beliefs would be beneath them and destined for hell, excommunicated. What is often ignored is that all these divisions and branches are from the same tree. If the root or trunk dies, so do all the branches, and the reverse would also be true. And that is what is heartbreaking, the fact that all these divisions judge each other, cast them into damnation, and in some cases even apostatize them, often for their sub or even sub-sub beliefs. The tree is still growing, and there is no knowledge of what new divisions shall appear in the future, be it near or far. Will that mean more divisions and more judgment to come? Or will, by some miracle, convergence start to unify the people of the faith? Only God knows.